Hello and welcome to today's A-Team Group webinar on regulatory change management, challenges, solutions and case studies. My name is Sarah Underwood, I'm an editor here at A-Team Group and I'm going to monitor uh, today's webinar. My, um, our expert speakers today are Linda Kaufman, Executive Vice President of the Reference Data Utility at SmartStream, uh, Jamie Walsh, Senior Director of Product Marketing at SAI360, Rabia Anwar, Partner at Keystone Law, and Conan Ware, Regulatory Product Manager at BNY Mellon. I'll ask them to introduce themselves in just a moment, but meantime, just a few uh, housekeeping tips for you. Uh, on your screen to the right of the video, you'll see a panel for polls and a panel for questions. We'll be running three audience polls today, so uh, you'll see the polls there as they come along. So please do vote in those and we can uh, gather some of your opinion on some of the issues we're talking about. In terms of the questions, please uh, ask your, uh, any questions you'd like to ask to the speakers as we go along. We'll uh, take them as we go along and not leave them to the end. So uh, post up your questions as and when you want to, and we'll answer as many as we can. So uh, let me come back to our speakers. And Linda, please uh, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your interest in regulatory change management. Hi there, uh, Linda Kaufman, Executive Vice President at SmartStream Technologies. Uh, I'm currently responsible for running the reference data utility, which we refer to as RDU. Uh, and we offer a number of regulatory products. So um, I've been kind of, in, you know, in the mix of regulation for the last couple of years and, and very happy to be here today to discuss with the panel about regulatory change. Thank you. Over to you, Jamie. My name is Jamie Walsh, and I've been with uh, SAI Global now for about 10 years, uh, you know, spanning across a number of different risk disciplines, including compliance risk and how regulatory change fits into that. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. And over to you, Rabia. Hi, everyone. I am Rabia Anwar. I'm a partner at Keystone Law. I'm a solicitor and advocate and attorney. I've specialized in financial services regulation for about 15 years. I'm very happy to be here with everyone today. Thank you. And over to you, Colin. Yeah, hi, I'm Colin Ware from BNY Mellon. I work in our asset services division. Um, as, I, as I said at the beginning, I'm a regulatory product manager. So really my role is to help our clients with regulations and find services and solutions that can help them meet their regulatory obligations. But uh, looking forward to the panels today. Thank you very much indeed to all of you. And uh, let's get started with an audience poll question, which you will be able to see, as I said earlier, to the right of your screen. screen. The question is, how does your organization expect the pace of regulatory change to alter over the next five years? While you mull on that, that one over, let me come to Jamie to set the scene and share his views on how he expects the pace of regulatory change to alter going forward. Yes, well, I, I do believe it's, it's you know continuing to increase in the pace. Um, and I expect that to continue and in fact, uh, slowly increase even, even faster. Uh, a lot of the regulation that we see is driven by societal criticism. And a lot of that seems to be happening much faster, you know, due to social media and, um, you know, events being, you know, live streamed across the world. And um, people are becoming a lot more vocal and loud and, and you know, really using the, the governments to, to really uh, help shape the, the way the world is. Um, and so that criticism is shared by employees and customers, not just shareholders. And because of that, you're seeing organizations, you know, wanting to be a little bit more proactive, not just to avoid higher costs, but also because it is just simply good business. Uh, you know, for shareholders, for employees alike, so. Okay, thanks, uh, Rubia, what would you add there in terms of uh, the pace at which we're going? I think I'd agree with Jamie that the pace is definitely picking up, and I think next year we're set to see a lot more. And I think the reason is that, in general, the pace of regulatory change tends to mirror uh, technological innovation, financial product innovation, and also nowadays it also takes into account and mirrors big shifts in society. So if you look at all those different arenas and areas, um, we're seeing a lot of change in all those ways and therefore regulation is going to chase to keep up. Um, I also think that in terms of the pace and also the focus of regulation and regulatory change, we'll see a slight shift from solely the classic 
conduct of business related regulation and prudential risk regulation to also sustainable finance, climate change, much broader areas. So a, a much wider range of regulation. And then I think the last thing I'd say in terms of what to expect going forward is, is potentially some structural changes as well. Um, I think we may see a few new regulatory bodies or organizations cropping up. And I say that not least because we ourselves are working on the launch of a very exciting new regulatory body. It will be a self-regulatory organization um, focusing on introducing standards and protections specifically for the crypto asset market and for non-fungible tokens. So I think in, 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 in relation to mirroring the innovation in financial products, we'll see a lot of regulatory change, both new regulations, but also new bodies springing up as well. Okay, thank you. I look forward to that very much. Uh, let's see uh, what our poll results look like. Okay, Jamie, would you like to uh, comment on that? Is that what you would expect to see? I would. I don't, I don't necessarily see there going to be dramatic changes to increase, but a steady increase in, in pace is, is definitely uh, palatable. I don't know how regulation could speed up knowing the, the types of bodies that uh, go into uh, the process uh, okay. and being able to move any quicker. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much indeed. And thank you everybody for voting on that one. And uh, bringing you in, Linda, what types of regulatory change are being made and what challenges do different types of change present in terms of timely compliance? Well, as we just heard, there's so many things happening, right? Whether it's um, uh, driven by, uh, you know, things happening in society, uh, new regulatory bodies, etc. cetera. Uh, it's really, we're seeing regulatory change in all shapes and sizes. Uh, whether it's a large, you know, refit like a mirror or a smaller change like uh, a change to, you know, ESMA's files. Um, they, they're coming in all different shapes and sizes uh, and they all fall under that umbrella of regulatory change. So um, you really need to uh, uh, kind of approach all, you know, make sure that you're handling all of them. So the bigger implementations tend to get more of the focus. Uh, so new regulations or big changes like refits, but the smaller changes can really impact compliance as well as uh, be more easily missed. So, uh, you know, reg reporting processes and technology are complex. It's like a, a spider web throughout, throughout the organization. So understanding, you know, even where there's small changes can really be effect effective. Um, and so I think that uh, they're coming in all shapes and sizes and it's not just the big ones that we need to worry about. I think it's the smaller ones as well. Okay, Colin, I'm coming to you as a practitioner, what do you see coming to light down the line? What kind of changes and what kind of impact do they have? Yeah, I mean, I'd actually like to really echo that point from Linda there, because, um, yeah, one of the things that, that we're looking at, um, especially with uh, our clients in mind at the moment, is, is how you do manage your regulatory change across the whole you know, breadth of your organisation. Because I think um, one of the biggest difficulties and one of the biggest factors that, that, that can limit companies is the fact that regulations aren't written globally they're written very much regionally um, and it doesn't always hit you in the most you know likely of places where you might have a fairly mature maybe compliance and, and risk um, you know infrastructure in terms of your headquarters you know or, or somewhere where you're domiciled but um, sometimes it's your smaller satellite offices that, that, that can uh, you know, as Linda said you know, maybe maybe catch people out a bit more because it, it's maybe not a regulation that's coming across their radar so to me that's probably the biggest challenge um, is definitely trying to look over over the horizon if you like to see what is coming up next and how you can plan for that um, I think uh, certainly in terms of, you know, the way that regulations are now beginning to, to come at us as well, and maybe echoing what, what Rabiel said as well, um, things like ESG, um, uh, the Capital Markets Union, for example, in the EU as well, are very much, you know, they're kind of giving pointers, if you like, that, you know, the regulations aren't necessarily, you know, coming along straight away. But they're beginning to the way that they're written and the way that some of the um, proposals are out there and some of the discussions and the white papers can at least begin to pinpoint where some of the uh, regulations that will come down you know, down the line in a couple of years time will actually hit and uh, 
that's probably one of the skill sets as well, I think, is to try and uh, just begin to see and, and not predict the future. That's the wrong way of looking at it, but to try and analyse and see where those next regulations might be. OK, splendid. And uh, Colin, staying with you, actually, um, how can financial institutions keep on top of all the regulatory change on a global basis and what sort of solutions are useful here? You've talked about the big guys, the small guys and, you know, trying to look forward. What can they do to, to keep on top of all of this? Yeah, I mean, certainly I think the whole industry and the market in general needs to try and automate this as much as possible. Again, it can be a very uh, time consuming very manual, very labour intensive process. I think trying to keep track of regulatory change, but that doesn't necessarily lend itself very well to, uh, to keep it abreast of all the different changes that are, that are required um, for any regulation um, and trying to track that around your organisation. So certainly to my mind anyway, it's, it's having some tools there that can both allow you to track the regulatory change but also bringing into a much wider kind of, um, I suppose, review across your organisation and across you know, many clients as to what is the scope of that regulation? It, you know, where is it going to actually impact? Where is it going to land within your organisation as well? Because that, again, will help um, companies and, and businesses to, to at least begin to reduce this idea at the moment where a regulation kind of hits us um, and then it's a very much a bit of a scramble to try and understand, well, you know, who's, who's actually in scope in, in that. And kind of everyone's in scope until you've ruled yourself out, that type of thing as well. So to try and be able to analyse and pinpoint a lot more and target exactly where that regulation will, will impact within, um, within an organisation, I think is going to be very key as well, because that will you know, help us all to be a lot more efficient um, to be you know actually a lot more um timely as well in, in addressing regulatory change because i think that's probably um you know whenever regulation comes along it's the first thing that everyone looks at is that implementation deadline um so unlike other projects where you might be able to work up to it you know that's very much you've got to almost work back from that deadline as to um you know what do we need to do in you know the six months the year or however long we've got to do it um and how do we do that in the most efficient manner so i think uh you know, any tools that can help, you know, a company to do that and then track that change through the organisation um, is, is definitely got to be an, an absolute boon for, for, any of, for any of us looking at uh, regulatory change at the moment. OK, thank you. Jamie, what would you say here in towards, toward, terms of uh, tools that people can use to help them? Yeah, so, I mean, having the, the right intelligence, not just on the regulation, but the theme driving the regulation before it even gets to regulatory bodies is certainly, you know, something that's very useful. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of things going on, uh, we'll say in Brexit, for example, but there were, you know, two to three years before that, uh, where you could understand where things were heading and monitoring it along the way before it gets there will help you start to do you know, devise your strategies. Um, many of the content providers that we work with, you know, do have this regulatory notifications across, you know, this, the whole horizon uh, from conceptual through enforcement. So, um, you know, we certainly, you know, encourage that uh, to certainly, you know, augment your own system, but then they provide a lot of augmented information to help understand where should it be routed? What's the scope? You know, trying to you know demystify the legalese that's going to be going into this. Um, many many organizations um, also have a lot of interest groups that work on helping to you know inform and formulate the actual regulation itself. Um, but then, from an operational perspective, you know, taking a best practice approach to measure impact from a couple of different areas and having some proven mitigation strategies for each of those types of uh, risks is, is definitely helpful. Okay, thank you. And moving on, let's see um, how the regulators are playing in this one. Linda, how much uh, help are you seeing coming from the regulators and how is this going to help our industry? Will it, will it, will it sort of um, ease the burden slightly? How are you seeing this? Uh, you've got your mute thing on, Linda. Can you... Um, of course. 
great. I didn't <laughs> want you to hear my, my barking dogs in the background. Um, <laughs> just like uh, the rest of us, I think the regulators have had to increase their levels of expertise in data and data management because of, of how much more data is playing a big role in, in compliance. And so it's not just the industry having to you know, send greater amounts of data to the regulators, but it's the regulators having to turn that data into something that makes sense in order to have to see the value of the regulation. And so due to this, I actually think the regulators have uh, a more empathetic approach to, to some cases which they're dealing with um, because they're facing the same challenges that the rest of us are having to manage as well. Of course, it always uh, there's always room for improvement, but certain things you know, are, are uh, apparent and especially in the world of standardization. I think they have a greater appreciation for standardization. Um, if we look at MIFID, for instance, uh, ESMA, you know, needs to track all those trading volumes for certain derivatives, for instance. Um, but how can they do that if all the firms are classifying derivatives differently? And I think it really pushed them to release um, the RTS2 classifications, right? So that everybody is starting to align because all of a sudden they're getting all inconsistencies and when they're trying to do their job as a regulator. So uh, I think that there's a greater appreciation from the regulator for standardization and data access so that what they're getting back um, that they have to um, ingest is not, uh, you know, garbage. Uh, and so I think little things like that, um, if they keep happening, it will hopefully streamline things for the industry and perhaps relieve a little bit of the burden currently felt by firms. Um, anything that falls under the umbrella of standardization is a good thing. And from our you know, interactions and what we're seeing, it, it feels more and more like the regulators are appreciating that. Okay, thanks, Linda. Maria, what would you say here in terms of uh, where the regulators are meeting the industry? I think I'd agree with Linda, actually, and I, I think um, data is a good example and having a lot of pragmatism around that. But also there's there's a real recognition that this is a time of economic recovery. And so you've seen some moves of, around pausing or delaying deadlines to allow firms to catch up in what has been essentially a time of crisis. You also see in the FCA's business plan 2021 to 2022, there was a lot of talk of innovation and competition and how innovation and competition really benefit consumers. And so when you put that all together, the recognition of the need for economic recovery and also not wanting to stifle competition and innovation, you can really see how there's a, a genuine desire there to be pragmatic and not create unnecessary burdens. Um, there's also an example of regulators being uh, really directly helpful in terms of reducing burdens on the industry and on the firms they regulate. So the FCA, I think it was earlier this year, went to the Supreme Court with an application to make sure that small businesses were able to get their pandemic related insurance payouts. So I think the FCA is to that extent really going above and beyond and doing everything that they can to um, remove any unnecessary burdens, particularly in light of what's going on. Okay, that's great. Fantastic. Let's take a quick uh, uh, pause here because I do have some questions for you from our audience. And um, yeah, let me uh, ask this one to you, Jamie. It touches on what we were talking about, about horizon scanning. And it says, how accurate is horizon scanning? Do we need two sources or an external and an internal function to make sure we are top on top of all the changes? Horizon scanning, great term. What does it really mean? And uh, do you need to have a sort of multiple source to make sure you're getting everything? Uh, I've not seen the approach to have, you know, multiple, multiple sources. Um, usually the pro co content providers that we've been working with um, do a lot of that analysis up front to understand all of the key pieces of information you need to understand what's coming when it's a, a, con a concept, once it is, you know, in a draft phase, uh, once it's become a final rule, and then once it's moved on to enforcement. So, uh, you know, certainly I, I can understand that concern, but from the most part, you know, the providers that we've, we've worked with uh, really take care and give you that accurate information that you need. Okay, thank you for that. And another one, I think uh, this one may be for you, Colin. Uh, it's quite diff it's difficult in its own way. It asks, please, would the panel advise on how we can track and manage different interpretations of regulatory change in different jurisdictions? And if anybody wants to jump in after Colin, do, please just let me know. 
Yeah, that's um, that's almost spooky because I was just about to to um, respond back on Jamie's oh, <laughs> response there as well. Because uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, Jamie's right. You don't need to have I don't think, multiple sources. Um, that's really what uh, you know the, the vendors and, and the data, you know, the data providers uh, should really be you know, scrubbing. And this is you know, publicly available data, if you like. Um, but the biggest challenge is the interpretation piece. Um, and that's the piece actually that uh, it, it will either tax you know everyone's minds of, of, of you know some very very experienced um, people within your organisation because it does tend to be that uh, you know you need your legal people, your risk people, your compliance people. Um, but what's often forgotten about as well is that you really need your your business um, side of the organisation to get involved in those discussions as well because um, you know we can all try to interpret what does that regulation mean um but if you can't understand then how it impacts your business then you know you're everyone's still a little bit lost and we're still wasting quite a lot of time so so the actual so trying to uh, get to the bottom of the interpretation absolutely is, is is a paramount importance um i think in in terms of you know, what, what can make that easier? What I would say is definitely get the business involved as early as possible in those discussions so that you don't, um, you know, just have maybe a kind of almost like a legal interpretation. I think in terms of what can help in, you know, looking at innovation as well and, and talking about how, in, you know, how some of the regulators can innovate, um, I think that kind of, uh, I guess, uh, nirvana maybe of, of having regulations written in you know much more kind of you know more machine readable text um, and you know maybe you know more standard standardized fashion if that's the right word to say um, would also help all of that as well and help help the market in general um, get to do you know exactly what what is the nub of that regulation and where where is it trying to hit um, and then potentially there is even um, you know some thoughts around could you have some market collaboration around it as well because I think you quite often do find with, with regulations that um, you know eventually it will be maybe an industry body um, you know a working group that's, that's pulled together certain uh, players within the financial services industry that you know kind of put their heads together if you like and uh, you know and I wouldn't call it the herd mentality but you would say that you know it's kind of getting a consensus of well what does that really trying to say what's it really trying to mean and and maybe you know what could help as well going forward is eventually that um you know there's a way of being able to sort of maybe play that back to regulators as well i think that's still um probably not a topic that, that many companies want to do because it was may may appear that you don't know quite what you're doing but you know maybe there's an opportunity going forward for people to actually be able to say, look, you know, this is where we think, you know, you're, you're trying to get to this, you know, what we, you know, these are the areas that um, the regulation is trying to uh, to pinpoint, um, you know, can we just, you know, can we check our understanding or can we even maybe, you know, say, you know, this, this potentially is a better way of doing it. Because I think, you know, in financial services in general now, you know, let's face it, you know, we, we all know that regulations are here to stay absolutely for the good. Um, so, you know, I think it's for you know, incumbent on the whole um, market infrastructure to try and work together now to, to improve it. And as Rabia said as well, um, following the pandemic, we're all in, you know, some fairly straightened economic position. And so anything that can help us drive down the costs of regulatory change as well has as got to be a good thing. Okay. Rabia, is that something that you work on as a, as a law firm, helping companies with... Uh regulations being interpreted in different jurisdictions in different ways? Absolutely. And uh, for my sins, I'm a solicitor in the UK and also an attorney in New York. So there are occasions <laughs> where we're looking at, um, you know, what the FCA thinks something should be defined as, and then what the SEC defines that same thing as. Um, and this happens with conventional products as well as new products. So the, one of the big discrepancies I was giving a legal opinion on the other day was around uh, whether something does or does not constitute a security for the purpose of the Securities Act in the US, and then whether it would constitute the equivalent here in the UK for the regulation here. And I think um, the more harmonization we can get, particularly amongst the major financial centers across the world, 
um, the better. But going back to the, the initial question asked, I agree the variation in taxonomy between different jurisdictions and even sometimes between the different regulations within the same jurisdiction is, is a major issue and um, it always has been really. Right, so more harmonisation, but it's never going to end. <laughs> It's, it's not. Yeah, sure, sure. And Linda, coming to you, you talked a little bit about uh, uh, working with regula regulatory bodies to sort of uh, try and ease the burden. The question sort of reviews that a little bit. Says, where does the panel see most regulatory interest in working with the market on reg change? Why is this and how do we get involved? Um, so we, I, I'm in the data space, right? That's my, my world. So we've been mostly involved in that and in the SI collaboration um, for the SI registry. And so it, again, I go back to my original point about data quality and understanding the importance of data. We just see a huge, um, you know, the regulator seems very open to, the regulators seem very open to putting that as a priority because they understand the impact that, um, you know, poor data has within their organization, but also within the, the industry itself. And I guess just to, to, and to circle back on what was just being said. So if you have the interpretation, um, uh, you know, the regulator has their version of the inter interpretation, right? Um, each firm, if you have the legal department can have their interpretation, but actually implementing it into practice is a whole nother level interpretation, right? So you can have lots of teams um, in agreement, um, but then if the if the um, technology team, for instance, that's implementing um, the interpretation that the firm has, we across the, our products, I would say there's not one client that does things the same way, right? They've all have their little interpretation twist here or there, and they've implemented the regulation a little differently. So I think that um, uh, just circling back to, to the other question, that I think that. Um, it, the interpretation has to be consistent all the way through the organization, not just at the, you know, even that business, um, as Colin said, the business needs to be involved. And then whoever's giving the instructions to the people building your automation need that interpretation to be uh, clear as well. But yeah, I think it's, 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 um, we're ha very happy that the regulators are, are really understanding that impact um, of, uh, of data and how, um, you know, to automate and make this real and make compliance real, um, that, the, that the data needs to be clean. So, so that's where personally I've had the most experience with the regulators as far as um, uh, their openness to, to improve internally. And um, I think that the collaboration, I think somebody said collaboration, maybe Colin, the collaboration piece of it, uh, they're appreciating collaborations, right? They're appreciating the industry um, groups that are coming together and giving their their advice, or the the uh, you know the APA is coming together and the SI um, registry collaboration that's appreciated because they know that all of those things help to to lead to to better compliance. Okay, and the end of the question was how can people get involved? Do they just knock on the regulator's door, or do you have to uh, jump through different uh, organisations before you reach the regulator? <laughs> uh, I'm I'm going to be very um, open that when we first started out on our journey, our, our method journey from a product perspective, uh, there was a, um, a very uh, time consuming process um, when we would submit questions and get back answers. Now that has become much more streamlined. Uh, we feel like the support has really, really increased um, even through the regular channels of, of, you know, help desks and everything else at the, um, and, um, we mainly deal with the uh, FCA and ESMA, and I would say that both are, are um, over the last year and a half maybe, have gotten much more um, uh, quick to answer and, and engaged with the industry. Okay, let's move on. Thank you for your questions to our audience and thank you for your answers. And uh, coming back to you, Colin, how do you see um, the uh, how do you see sort of best practice approaches that can help firms achieve a more holistic regulatory change change management as you said you know we've also it's 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 fairly fractured in many places uh there is a need for this kind of harmonization how can firms approach this yeah i think um it, it's echoing a lot what's what's been said already and, and who would have believed it that uh data is now sort of a king all over again um i worked in data operations and data governance um 
and data around regulations for many years as well. Um, it's taken a long time knocking on people's doors to say that I think this is quite important. Um, absolutely now, it's, it's the data control and data quality. Um, if we're talking about best practice, um, is making sure that that is absolutely watertight. You have, have data owners, you have data stewards. Um, you also understand the data sets that are required for regulation. So, um, you know, they can, um, despite the fact we've been talking about how differently regulations are written, you can begin to pick out from your own systems, you know, some common sets of data that will be required because, you know, you know, it's quite often, you know, identifiers, that type of thing um, that, um, you know, you can, you know, pull into maybe a sort of a data repository or a central um, data um, strategic service that, um, that, you know, multiple projects can then use, because I think that, that that is a, you know, a very good practice as well to, to, um, to get, you know, involved with. Um, I think, again, we're talking about, you know, trying to look further forward as well so let's uh you know try and stop being tactical i think again you know maybe when, when regulations st first started the first wave hit us all we were just trying to you know manage it tactically it was just getting over the line somehow making sure that we did we were complying or, or at least um you know trying as much as possible to to um to comply with that regulation but it didn't lend itself very well for a strategic view so I think now any good practice is to definitely look what's coming over the horizon, try and understand where that um, is going to land in the next two, three, five year plans. Um, beginning to understand, OK, these are the data sets we're going to need or more than likely going to need. These are particular systems we might need to look at in terms of the impacts. Um, you know, I think obviously that, the, you know, the digital revolution is going to, help with that to some extent but um you know i think there's you know there's an awful lot of legacy systems still within within financial services so that still has to be overcome but i think if we can begin to look over the horizon a bit more because that also helps with the whole end process as well because i think uh in terms of best practice in, in my experience as well across you know different organizations it's quite often the last point is to suddenly, you know, realise, oh, we need to demonstrate how we've complied with this regulation now. We've done a great programme. We've done multiple work streams. And then everyone sort of runs around at the end trying to work out, well, how should we actually demonstrate that, that we did, you know, do what we did and, and we did tick all the boxes and we are complying with the regulation. So it's to try and get a kind of, I suppose, a, a more of a straight through seamless process around that right from where you've taken on the regulation, you're understanding the regulation, um, and then you're beginning to show how you're going to, to demonstrate how you're going to comply with that regulation. And then also not last but not least as well, how are you going to report on that regulation as well? That is, again, something that we help our clients with, um, you know, across the board really is, um, you know, don't wait until the last minute to understand, well, how do we report on this regulation? Try and build on that and, and look at it, you know, up front because actually, the same data that you're going to take on board to understand the regulation, you can also use then to report on the regulation at the end as well. So take that all the way through your, your processes and um, and your you know your systems as well. Okay. Linda, what would you say there in terms of, sort of holistic regulatory change management? I remember well, five, six years ago, we started to talk about harmonization across regulations and the problem with tactical stuff and everything like that. You know, we're still talking about it. How can people make it better still? Yeah, I think that we can no longer, um, you know, a couple of years ago, you built out your budget and your roadmap for your work in the following year based on um, when a regulation was going to go live. So if a big regulation was going to go live, it went in your roadmap. I think that we have to consistently uh, block out a chunk of, of budget and roadmap because it's not it's not these one hit big wonders anymore. Every year there's new guidance that comes out. Um, there's, you know, a, a, a little tweak here. There's a divergence between FCA and S, but whatever it is, you're going to have some work to do in the regulatory space. So you can no longer say, oh, okay, I don't have any big regulations this year. I'm going to ignore regulation. I think um, to put it, you know, uh, a chunk of, of devotion towards regulation every year is how you're going to keep regulatory change uh, and your organization healthy going forward. 
And then the other thing which we've been beating up a lot um, and it's coming through, I think from all of us is the coordination of the team. So best practices is to make sure that um, everybody has a voice when it comes to implementation of regulatory change at, at a firm. So you're not just <clears throat> dealing with one team. I mean, there are, you know, a, a change could come along and compliance could review it and say, this has nothing to do with us, but the change could mean that a data feed coming into your organization is changing. And if you don't do some kind of development work, your existing functionality is going to blow up, right? And if you don't have both teams at the table, then you're going to be um, in trouble, even with the things that are applicable to your organization. So I would say the two things is make sure you dedicate, you know, every single year, a chunk of, of budget and resources to regulatory change, because even if it's not on the calendar yet, it's going to be something's going to pop up. And then the other thing is to make sure that you have um, everybody at the table, which we've been saying, I think all of us have been saying, yeah. Okay, thank you. And let's uh, dig a little bit deeper and I'm going to come back to you, Colin, uh, to talk a little bit about the knock-on effects of regulatory change in terms of, sort of associated controls, risk management and policies and how these issues can be managed because I think uh, sometimes they're not in instantly seen. Yeah, first of all, I was going to invite Linda into our Capital Planning Committee, actually, because that was perfectly put about how we can get a regulatory budget. So fantastic, but absolutely, you know, totally right, Linda, uh, all the way through. Um, now people can't just plan that there's, a, you know, regulations are going to happen, you know, and oh, definitely this this date. Um, there's lots of things that happen in, intra during the year now as well that you have to take account of. So that's... Um, a really good point and it, it kind of leads to I guess suppose my answer on this one as well is that um, it is the socialization of, of regulations as well it, it's it's how you get um, you know your risk functions your control functions your compliance functions um, and your business all pulling in the same way because I think that's that's absolutely crucial as well and uh, you know it depends on you know some of our client base sometimes those those people are you know, one of the same, so someone might be doing all three or four of those jobs, um, which must be, uh, you know, quite quite difficult when you get, get regulations as well. But um, in terms of even larger organisations, you, you, you need to be able to socialise that, that particular regulation, understand definitely where, where it's going to impact you. And then I think it's very much sort of having some strong governance processes around it as well. So it's going to be, um, you know... I think in terms of not just not just traditional project management, you know, kind of, you know, all the good practices around that as well, but it's having the governance to understand, you know, that we have captured everyone, we have ticked all the boxes and, and that all the teams that could be impacted have been brought into that conversation because I think, you know, we've all probably been in positions where it's right at the last minute, suddenly someone will realise, ah, there's a team that hasn't been told about it, needs to do something, has some actions on that. Um, so it's how you how you manage to keep all of those people in, in the loop, but also make sure that they are responding back. You know, they're coming back on actions. They're coming back to say, yes, I've got, you know, I'm aware of what this regulation is going to be. I'm, I'm already beginning to tackle it, that type of thing. Um, and then massively, again, talking around the communication front, um, it's also beginning to talk across your you know, you know, across your organization, across different lines of business as well. So it's understanding, you know, what are the knock-on effects, if you like, um, and you know, and collaborating together. Because I think quite often as well, um, you know, within you know fairly you know, large institutions, you can sometimes find that you know you may have three or four different teams possibly looking at the same or, you know, same regulation, but just from different angles. So it's how do you bring them together? How do you get them to work together, collaborate together, um, share sort of resources, share some of the communications? And last but not least as well, you know, if we're talking about how you manage that regulatory change, is definitely talk to your clients a lot more, you know, early in the process as well. Sometimes quite often those regulations will, will mean that, you know, there might be something different that you need to do with the clients. There might be some, some different way that you need to contract with them um, or even just a different way that they might have to process this as well. So it's very, very crucial to talk to your clients as early as possible in the whole process as well to make sure that they 
are aware of what's coming up. If they, if you need to turn, you know, to to change terms and conditions or just change, you know, practices or processes, you're giving them that time, um, and you're also giving the you know the, the chance for them to come back and ask questions and everything else. So I think that's you know massively crucial as well. Is that sometimes I guess regulation has this uh, effect on us all. I think to the fact that you know, we really need to make sure we could, we are complying with a regulation. But guess what? There's, there's a whole ripple effect out there as well. And those, you know, those clients and um, people outside your organisation also need to be brought into, into the bigger picture as well. So that's an absolutely crucial part of the process. OK, thank you. Coming over to you, Jamie, I know you work in this area. Uh, how would you uh, help people to see what needs to be done as part of all these ripple effects inside and outside the firm? Yeah, so I would say I'm a big process person. So anytime you can move from a reactive approach to a proactive approach, the better. You know, there's obviously some costs associated with that, but the benefits tend to outweigh the costs. Um, and, and, the, and the reason is that this is allows you to you know, better focus and articulate successful strategy for your policy development your control implementation, and just overall managing risk, uh, which, by the way, is not always eliminating it, but just managing it to align to your organization's risk appetite. Um, you know, a lot of what's been said before about the collaboration, part of that is understanding, yes, there's regulation and there's something we need to do about it, but there are also costs associated with it. And then there's, you know, penalties and, and other reputational damage that all has to be weighed out. And sometimes the response is no response, sometimes. Uh, but at least you have a process for, you know, vetting that out and coming to that conclusion and everyone collaborating together to come to that. And it wasn't just a top-down decision. It was a collaborative decision. Um, you know, this is the heart of what we are starting to see a lot more now, which is resilience, not just having a plan for what could happen, but monitoring what is coming, not just what's happening right now. Uh, so as we, you know, move forward, we're, you know, helping to uh, look at providing creative uh, strategies for mitigation. Um, you know, sharing data across, you know, customers that, you know, proves that, you know, they thought about this, and there is some information that you can also glean uh, for your organization. So, um, you know, those are some of the the knock-on effects that I see. Okay, splendid. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, let's run another audience poll. This time, the question is, what types of emerging technologies does your organization use or plan to use to support regulatory change management? Now, this time you can tick as many boxes as you like. So uh, while you do that, let me come back to Jamie to talk a little bit about the kind of technologies, tools, solutions, and services that are available and emerging for reg uh, change management. Yeah, so certainly we see, you know, several organizations still out there managing this whole process with spreadsheets and office tools, and it's it's just simply too big and too fast for that. Um, you know, the data scraping alone, as Linda's team will probably attest to, is more than a full time job. I know I, I actually did automate this uh, those types of processes at a former company, uh, fifteen years ago. Um, and this area is ripe for robotic process automation, but you know, data providers like Linda, is, or they're already taking care of a lot of that. Um, moving forward, you start to see the augmenting of raw data to provide, you know, some interpretation information or some applicability information, the scope and digesting requirements into really actionable things, which is very helpful for an organization to, you know, move quicker or at least plan quicker uh, and get to what is the you know, plan or what is the strategy we're going to use once this becomes enforceable. Um, so we'll see a lot of natural language processing to make recommendations about applicability, um, either from the data provider side or even on the tool side uh, is something that, you know, that we can uh, certainly get into. So it gets routed to the correct departments for, you know, further analysis and collaboration. Okay, thank you very much indeed. And uh, Linda, what do you see here in terms of useful technologies? Yeah, I think the, um, so I uh, agree with Jamie and I think the, the reg tech area right now, you know, industry is just exploding and there are so many useful tools out there um, that have a very broad range. Uh, the solutions, I think that 
make the most sense are the ones that bring together the combination of technology and human expertise and kind of, you know, couple it together can really bring in efficiencies into organizations. Um, I see very good regulatory mapping tools that help to understand the implications of the regulation and um, data access uh, tools. So in, again, back to the data, um, which is my world, uh, the use of APIs are becoming much more widespread. It really takes the burden off of firms um, to manage really large sets of data. And the key for regulatory data is that it means that they can react to regulation, you know, regulatory changes a lot faster. Uh, because they, they have um, an easier means to onboard and get access to the data. So we see that. And then as for data content, you know, nothing is straightforward when it comes to these reports um, and reporting. So uh, across most reporting, there's a lot of data derivation that needs to take place. And so, you know, you see that the data service providers such as ourselves and others can really help firms alleviate the burden of maintaining all the complex derivation rules. And so I see a heavier reliance and that brings into, um, you know, uh, part of that discussion is machine learning, et cetera, and so forth that even the data providers are, are, are really relying on more and more, um, but, you know, at times it could get complex. You, know, you have attribute A that you have to report and it takes six fields to derive attribute A and then regulatory change comes around and guidance comes out. And then, you know, those six fields now turn to eight fields because, you know, there's, there's more that you need to look into. And so being able to use these tools to more efficiently bring in all of that change and not have it disrupt um, within an organization's uh, regulatory uh, framework, which could include, as Colin said, some legacy systems, et cetera, and so forth. So to be le as least um, disruptive as possible by using a lot of these tools, uh, I think re really brings in the efficiencies and, and we'll continue to, to build on that. Okay, maybe see the poll results. And uh, Linda, would you like to uh, comment on these? on the poll results, so regulatory intelligence. <laughs> I think that we all, you know, the smarter we can make our, our machines, the better. Uh, and so I, I understand that artificial intelligence. I think um, Jamie and I both mentioned um, some machine learning, uh, which goes through this whole, you know, the last. So this is all, every answer really is around building in more intelligence into our processing, which I, I completely agree with. Okay, thank you for that. And thank you, everybody, for taking part in the poll. And uh, Linda, actually staying with you, you'd mentioned third party service providers. How do you see this going? Obviously, you know, with a lot of data, uh, some firms want to work with other other parties. How, how does that work? And what what is what is best in terms of using third party services? Yeah, it's funny because we're, we're, the word collaboration has come up so much today, but I'm going to use it yet again, uh, because I think that um, the best, you will get the most out of your third party relationships when it comes to uh, regulatory um, uh, reporting and, and all the tools involved with good engagement. Um, and so you really need to, when it comes to regulation, because a firm is ultimately responsible for that reporting, whether you're you know, integrating a number of third party uh, service providers or not, you need to treat the, the, the third party like it's a partner or, or part of your organization to a large degree. And so um, I really look you know, for third party service providers who offer subject matter expertise. So it's not you know, an out of the box solution where the regulator comes knocking on your door and you can't really tell them why you uh, reported something or you know, why the data looked a certain way at a certain time. Uh, if you have that collaborative uh, relationship with your third party provider, uh, then then those answers are, are much easier to, to, to provide to the to the regulator. Uh, like I said earlier, we have no two clients that have attacked the regulation in the same way. So um, each firm has a different approach and assessing the market to understand all the third party services that are available. Like I said, RegTech is just exploding at the moment. So I think that um, if you have a third party uh, um, already, then you need that collaboration and that really um, close relationship so that you can answer the questions. If you don't and you have challenges, then it's really worth the time and effort to go out there and take a look at all of the, um, the, the tools and, and services that are available because there are a lot. 
Uh, and you know, some some firms are are big. You know, it's the buy versus build. Some firms are really um, focused on building, and they want to build their whole solution themselves. However, there's little challenges. So you know, finding that niche third-party provider that can provide that little bit that will help you drastically, um, even though you've built most of the solution. Uh, it's possible now. There's that many solutions out there. So whether you're somebody who's going to buy a more complete product offering or somebody that is looking for something to just kind of plug a, a need in your organization, it's worth the time and effort to go out there and look at all the, the um, you know, services and tools that are available to you because uh, it, it's such a growing sector and, and you can really build in some efficiencies by doing that. Okay. So coming to you, Colin, from a practical perspective as a practitioner, how does that work with uh, third-party services? And things that yeah, I, I, I think um, absolutely. There's, there's lots of very good um, solutions and, and companies now in that, that reg tech space that's been growing and growing over the years. I think that does then lend itself actually to, it's probably harder actually to find the right solutions to, to meet your particular requirements. Um, because there is such a broad landscape now. So the actual whole process of you know, deciding on who to partner with um, it has become probably more complex. Um, you know, certainly within our own organisation, we, we have a partnerships team that, that, that we will work with. And it's, then a, it's also enabling the integration of those tools as well. And I think um, the crucial factor, uh, you know, that all of those tools that, that, that are out there in the market, without a doubt, you know, the data is going to be key to how those tools still operate. Those, you know, those those solutions don't have, you know, the data that, that will really enable them to become more um, uh, more intelligent. Because I'm going back to the poll results about the regulatory intelligence, which I was very uh, very pleased and gratified to see that came out top. Um, you know, that's something that, that we've been you know working with and and, and um, exploring ideas around yes helping helping our clients you know beginning to understand what are the regulations that are coming down down the pipe um but it's not just then throwing lots of data at them it's trying to establish and utilize the the knowledge that we have around clients so obviously you know we have many clients and we, we have an understanding of what markets are in which jurisdictions they're in um you know in terms of um, you know, just being able to, to see their, their holdings and, and their transactional patterns. And is it, you know, so what we've been looking at is, is, is sort of turning that round and seeing if we can utilise that information to actually provide much more targeted regulatory updates so that it's not just a, a kind of still everyone having to interpret everything and try to work out whether they're really, you know, involved or not. Um, but it's giving them a better chance to maybe you know, understand a bit more succinctly that, uh, you know, they will be impacted by regulation because they're trading in a certain market or because they, you know, they've got a satellite office in a particular country, that type of thing. So it's beginning to kind of drill down a lot more. So um, regular inter regulatory intelligence, yeah, very, um, it's good to see that that, that that was top of the poll because that's certainly, you know, something that without a doubt we're, we're looking to try and help our clients with over the, over the next year or so. Um, and, you know, how you can best integrate those tools into your organisation is probably the, the other major factor about, you know, working with, with third-party service providers. And also, as I said before, maybe just making sure that you're not just utilising, um, you know, a tool that, that might look good on the surface, but, uh, you know, maybe doesn't actually do or, or get you anywhere um, towards you know, you, you know, understanding your regulatory burden or, or, or comply with regulations as well. So that's very, um, very important. Okay, thank you. And coming back to you, you Rubia, can you talk us through a little bit of an example of a successful deployment of regulatory change and the benefits that can be delivered beyond compliance? We see benefits going beyond compliance pretty much every day, but a good example of this would be we do a lot of work with clients, international businesses, whether it's banks, investment managers, insurance, a uh, few tech companies as well, where they are seeking to come into this market and get authorized here. And so that usually triggers a large scale regulatory review analysis and then essentially a regulatory change project. Um, and in doing that, uh, we'll, I'm finding increasingly that clients will ask for 
us to take a really broad lens approach and look at really wide regulatory risks. So not just your, again, classic conduct of business prudential, but also a really dive into the data, which I know Linda will be happy about, but also risks around uh, some of the other areas that you wouldn't normally expect to cover. And so the, the ancillary benefit that we see is that we will end up picking up on risks and issues that they may not have been aware of and potentially averting some sort of scandal or reputational crisis a year down the line because it's been picked up in advance. Um, and then other, I suppose, more direct uh, examples as well, we had a client client recently where we were advising on the different rules around uh, billing and commission and the way fees are shared between it was two banks. We're advising one of them. And we actually worked out that um, for once uh, our client was not charging enough to, to their customers. Um, and so that was probably the fastest I've ever seen a client move to remediate a gap. <laughs> straight away normally you have to persuade them a little bit to remediate <laughs> straight away they closed it off um so so you do there are a lot of benefits like that um which which crop up which go well beyond just being able to say that you're complying but actually translate into real uh revenues generating or saving benefits lovely thank you uh, jamie do you have a similar sort of similar or different even example <laughs> Yeah, I mean, many of the clients that we have are in financial services, banking and insurance. And, uh, you know, their IT teams, legal teams, they're busy with so many activities. Um, and so for us to, you know, partner with data providers to reduce the efforts, you know, certainly allows them to focus their valuable resources, you know, elsewhere uh, in much more value added uh, areas. The ability to support them with a consistent process uh, from turning regulatory concepts into action uh, really just speaks to having them become a lot more resilient and reducing, you know, their, their risk. Um, and then lastly, uh, the ability to provide metrics all around the change management program and make it more measurable allows them to, you know, better demonstrate how compliance risk fits into their broader view of enterprise risk and better decision making. Okay, excellent. And uh, we are coming close to time. So uh, that's our last um, item for today. Let me ask our speakers what guidance they would give to people working in the space of uh, regulatory change management. So, um, Jamie, would you like to kick off on that one? Sure. Uh, so look early and often at your regulatory intelligence, wherever that might be coming from. Um, uh, measure what you're doing today. Uh, so that you may measure, you know, return on investment and time to value if you do decide to, you know, allow for some technology enablement and uh, digitization. Um, and big mantra with SAI 360 is, you know, think big, but start small. We have a wealth of different uh, risk management solutions across a number of different terrains. And, uh, you know, one thing that they want to do is buy it all. But you, you really need to have a plan for showing some iterative uh, uh, wins uh, early and often. Okay, Linda, what would you say? Um, back to that word collaboration, but make sure that all the internal teams are talking to each other uh, when eva evaluating uh, regulatory change, and that includes your third party. Uh, subject matter expertise, invest in subject matter expertise internally and externally. And then lastly, be proactive. I'm in agreement with, with Jamie, like get ahead of it. Assume regulatory change is coming each year when planning your budgets and roadmaps. Don't just plan for the big ticket items and ensure that your control framework is in place to monitor for change, but also advanced enough to catch issues when things fall through the cracks because they are gonna fall through the cracks. So that risk mitigation. Okay, lovely, Rabia. I would say keep an eye on what's going on in other jurisdictions. And there's a couple of reasons for that, really. So firstly, if you look at other major financial centers and regulators, sometimes you can see themes where they mirror each other. So it can help to keep an eye on what's coming out of the SEC or maybe what's coming out of MAS in Singapore. And you can you can maybe see what's coming down the road. And then, and then the other reason to do that, I think, is now more so than ever before, you have a, it's so easy to, uh, through digitization, skip between different jurisdictions if you're playing the markets. 
So there's a real risk of regulatory arbitrage. So um, I would say definitely keeping an eye on other jurisdictions, beware of the lack of harmony in taxonomy, be prepared for it. We touched on that earlier. And then lastly, uh, I think review everything in light of the big shifts that we're going through, not only in the industry, but in terms of how we live. Really good example of that is how payments have become fully electronic now. Everybody's using electronic payments. So some of the regulatory controls that would have been designed for the old world maybe won't capture and mitigate the risks that, that apply in the new world. So it's, it's worth sort of doing a review of all those controls now. Okay, thank you. I'm just afraid we're gonna to have to leave it there for now because we really are running out of time at this point. So um, thank you all. And uh, thank you uh, to SmartStream and to SAI360 for sponsoring today's webinar. It's been a very interesting conversation. Before we close up, just a few aging proof items that may be of interest to you. If you scroll down your screen to additional options, you'll see that you can download 18 Group's latest regulatory data handbook and our ESG handbook 2021. You can also access 18 Connect, a new and powerful immersive professional platform that you can use to deliver highly effective inter and interactive events and webinars of your own. That said, that's it for today. So thank you again to Linda Rabia, Jamie and Colin. And thank you to all of you who have taken part in the webinar. Please complete our feedback form as we're keen to hear your views and improve our products. Thanks again and goodbye.